Uh, did everybody get a handout, or I mean an uh, outline? This is kind of like a syllabus, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, well, dates on it, uh, topics, text, things like that. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice on this is um, we're going to be going through uh, several different topics. They're all going to build on each other. Uh, overall, what we're doing this fall is uh, Wednesday nights are about how to defend our faith and really how to share the gospel because ultimately defending the Christian faith means giving the gospel. It doesn't mean you know, beating up somebody intellectually or something like that or winning an argument. It means sharing the gospel so that the person that does not believe might hear and, and believe. So overall, that's the target that we're going to be shooting at. Um, one other thing that you'll notice, uh, we have scriptures in that far right-hand column. Uh, it is vitally important that whatever I say is tied to the Bible. If it is not, don't believe it. I mean, it's as simple as that. So we're going to have kind of some theme text for every week that we're going to go through. And there are also, uh, we've kind of designed those so that they'll build in our overall argument, starting from basic building blocks. Why are we doing this and how do we do it? That's tonight, introduction. To our foundation for knowledge, how do Christians know what they know and how can they defend what they know? That'll be next week. And then we'll kind of move on uh, from there. Um, So, Folks that have been really helpful to me. I'm just going to show you guys three books. uh, And they're all a little bit different. But uh, this first one is by Cornelius Van Til, V-A-N-T-I-L. He's a Dutchman. So the DeGraff family would really like Van Til, I know. Um, I don't know if he was a dairy farmer, but he was an incredible philosopher and a bold Christian. Uh, His book, Christian Apologetics, looks at the philosophical side of apologetics while building on Scripture, one of the things that I learned from this man is never abandon the Bible when you're defending the truth of the gospel. Uh, People have fallen into that trap. We'll meet on some sort of neutral ground. You know, you're the expert in this field, I'll be the expert in that field, and we won't bring the Bible in. Well, Van Til says, you do that, you lost. You lost. So, very helpful. I'll be drawing from Van Til. Uh, one of Van Til's students is a guy by the name of Greg Bonson, B-A-H-N-S-E-N. He wrote this book, Always Ready. Uh, Bonson is probably my favorite debater. He's dead, died in 1995 uh, at the age of 47, but he was a very bright light who lived for a very short time. Uh, this book, Always Ready, the chapters in it are about three to five pages long. So if you're looking for, like, one book to have on apologetics, this would be the book that I'd buy. It's really good, and it's saturated in Scripture. Greg Bonson, B-A-H-N-S-E-N. And if you have a road trip coming up in your near future, I know that might be some of you guys, uh, he has a debate called The Great Debate. It's about two and a half hours long. Fantastic. So that'll whet your appetite. Once you hear that, you'll go, all right, I need to read his book. And anyway, so that book is great. Uh, What's that? Well, uh, so he's he's looking at his uh, major breaks are this, the lordship of Christ in the realm of knowledge. We're going to talk about that next week. The conditions necessary for the apologetic task. Um, how to defend the, the faith, section three. Section four, the conditions necessary for apologetic success. So what would success look like when you're defending the faith? And then finally, uh, his fifth section is answers to apologetic challenges. So, um, you know, problem of evil, the supernatural, the problem of faith, the problem of religious language, miracles, things like that. We'll deal with that at the very end. And this last book is really good as well, uh, Surviving Religion 101, written by Michael Kruger. You, you can't be an expert in everything. Um, I'm sure by y'all's age, you know that. So we've got to depend on others who are going to devote themselves to 
you know, a topic and really nail it. Uh, Michael Kruger is actually a church history professor um, at R Reformed Theological Seminary. He's written several other books that I've read that have dealt with uh, issues that have faced Christianity. Specifically, the one that I really liked um, dealt with the issue that Dan Brown made up when he developed his Da Vinci Code book. Remember that? When it was real popular. Uh, well, Dan Brown actually was trying to make popular an academic theory. Uh, he stole it. And the guy he stole it from was a, man, a, a German by the name of Walter Bauer. He stole it. He put a little novel twist to it. And he made millions of dollars on heresy. Uh, the guy that wrote this book has another book that's designed to answer that question, and it was phenomenal. It's called The Heresy of Orthodoxy. Uh, this book is important because uh, Kruger is a father who's sending his kids off to college, and as he sends his daughter off to college, he wrote this for her in order for her to, to be able to survive college, the major issues that she's going to face. So it's uh, very short chapters, very not a lot of like jargon in it, very digestible. If you have a kid going to college, then this would be the one that I would give them. Okay. All right, well, let's get started tonight. Um, we're trying to set the overall tone for our discussion on defending our faith. And to do that, uh, the text that I want to use is 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. So this is going to be our hub text. And from that, uh, we're going to develop several principles, namely four that we're going to look at a little bit later. But as we move into 1 Peter, we have to first talk about the historical context in which Peter's writing. So 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, Peter addresses this letter to elect exiles. Elect exiles. And he's writing to those that are in what is called the dispersion. So Northwest Asia Minor. Date sometime between 64 and 68 A.D. What's going on in the world between 64 and 68 A.D.? Does anybody know? Everything's great in the world between 64 and 68 A.D. You know, life is good to be a Christian at that point in time. No, it's not. Um, Nero's persecutions had already broken out by this point in time. Christianity was persona non grata. Christians were the ones that the Roman Empire hated. Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire. It was actually illegal for the first 200 years of its existence. So if you think that we're experiencing persecution today, and it's, oh man, you know, we have a godless government that doesn't really like our worldview very much. Well, at least they're not killing us. You know, it could be a lot worse. He sure did, yes. He would dip them in tar, light them on fire. He would dress them up on, with animal skins, parade them into the Colosseum, and release, you know, lions and leopards and things like that, and wild dogs to uh, kill Christians. So it was a very tough time to be a Christian in the first couple of hundred years of, of the church's existence. We could say that the early church was born into adversity, until the Edict of Milan, which is 313 A.D., Christians were actively sought out and persecuted in the Roman Empire. Uh, four actions were developed by Rome to take care of the Christian problem. First, Christian churches were to be destroyed when found. Second, I want to talk about this a little bit. I learned something last week. I'm always learning. I hope you know that. Uh, second, copies, and this would be thousands of copies of the Bible were burned. Were burned. So I went to a lecture last week by uh, James White. James White's specialty. He's, he is an apologist. He travels around the country and around the world defending the Christian faith against basically any and everyone. And he's very solid. His mind is like an iron trap. Uh, just a brilliant, brilliant guy. But he was talking to us about textual criticism because 
one of the things that college students face is they face non-believing teachers who will teach religion classes. And in these religion classes, they will make it their life's mission to destroy the faith of Christians. And one of the ways that they do that is by trying to undermine the Bible. Uh, and so this man has spent his whole life learning all of the ancient languages uh, probably better than I know them and uh, reading through ancient manuscripts and papyri and things like that. He made this observation last week, and I, I just had never put this together. Uh, but he said this. He said, uh, there, there, there's over 5,800 manuscripts of the New Testament. 5,800 manuscripts. Now, I know y'all are hearing that number, and that sounds like a lot because it is. Uh, in the ancient world, ancient documents in the ancient world, it is highly rare for an ancient document to have more than a dozen manuscripts of it. Copies, manuscript copies of a particular work. And the New Testament has 5,800 manuscripts. Okay, dating from the early 2nd century uh, all the way into the medieval time period. Uh, but, and, and we're going to talk about time periods in just a little bit, but uh, one of the earliest pieces of the New Testament is a papyri dated to 125 A.D. of the Gospel of John. John was probably written, the Gospel of John was probably written, you know, 90 A.D., that's not a lot of time between the writing of the original document and people making copies, spreading it out. How was Christianity spread? It was not spread by, you know, let's write the whole book down and here you go, you know, Joey. Now, now you just take this, take this one document and just, you know, let people read it. No, they would take portions of the New Testament, they would copy them down and circulate it throughout the empire. Um, so this is what James White pointed out last week. He said that during the first couple hundred years of the church, if you look at those early papyri, uh, what you find is that often the divine name in those will be shortened to just two letters, like a theta sigma uh, or an uh, iota sigma. So theta sigma for God, iota sigma for the Son, you know, or a key row, uh, two first letters of the name of Christ. And I knew that, but I didn't know why. And he said this, he said, okay, the Romans in the first 200 years are gathering up copies of the New Testament, and they're burning everything they can. In Alexandria, North Africa, they plundered the library there, burned over 10,000 manuscripts. 10,000 of the Bible. Horrible. But the Bible lived on, Right? So if a Roman is picking up a manuscript and scanning it to see what it is, and he doesn't see the full divine name written, Theos or Quios or Jesus or you know, something like that, he would be prone to let that one survive and go after other things, right? So the Christians in this time period, in the first couple of hundred years, would write the divine name in what's called the nomina sacra, which is the sacred name. They would write the sacred name in a shortened format. And in that way, many of the copies, the papyri copies of the, of the New Testament were preserved because they didn't know what they were reading. Isn't that great? Uh, doesn't that speak to the Holy Spirit's provision? Do you have a question, Karen? Okay. Um. So yeah, the manuscript for the evidence, or the manuscript evidence of the New Testament is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And non-believers, when they look at this evidence, what do they say? Well, there's too much evidence for me to believe that. Okay. We'll talk about evidence later. Uh, the third thing that the Romans did is they said that all Christians were to be deprived of both public office and civil rights. So there were Christians that were in the aristocracy, the kind of upper classes and things like that, uh, Rome robbed them of their status position, robbed them of their rights. Uh, and then fourthly, all Christians were to sacrifice to the gods or, or to be thrown in prison uh, and tortured. 
the early church knew what it was to face persecution. So the point that I'm trying to make here is when Peter is writing about how to make a defense, he's writing to a group of people that are having to make a defense for their faith. Some of them are going to be drug in front of, you know, civic trials. Some of them are going to be making their defense in maybe more of an informal context. But the whole church is going to, to face a very hostile field, and they must give an answer for their hope. So, uh, point of our passage, let's read it. Actually, let's get a, just a little bit of context. Um, verse 14 into 15. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. So he's talking about suffering. He says, have no fear of them. Who says them do you think he's talking about? Yeah, probably the Roman Empire, those within the Roman Empire that are persecuting Christians. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, or set apart Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Okay. So we, we want to be ready to honor the Lord Jesus Christ as holy and to make our defense. Uh, let's look at the literary context, and then we'll jump into the elements of 1 Peter 3.15. Peter's a pastor, and as a pastor, he's picturing the Christian life as a pilgrimage in which we're traveling through this world. This world is not our home. It's a place where we experience some highs, a lot of lows, and a lot of affliction. And as we're making this journey through the Christian life, Peter's going to quote or allude to Psalm 34. This is in verses 10 through 12. So go back with me. Let's look at some more context. Um, Do not repay evil for evil, verse 9, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing and now he kind of sets it in a biblical context. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is, is against those who do evil. Let his tongue keep from evil. Let his lips keep from speaking deceit. Um, I'm going to talk about the problem of neutrality later. However, the Christian can never abandon the Bible. Don't be ashamed of the Bible. The Bible is our defense it's also containing our gospel that we give to this world. So as, as the psalmist is speaking about keeping your lips from deceit, one of the ways that we keep from deceit is by being grounded right here. point is that if I'm grounded in another place beyond Scripture, that I'm prone to be on a shaky ground or I'm prone to be in an area that might be deceptive, and wrong. So Peter's looking at the Christian's place in so society and the role of unjust suffering that believers experience. His audience are in the Roman world, and they're tempted to fear men rather than God. What can the persecutors do to the early church? Well, they can kill you, but that's about all they can do to you. You might recall the words of Jesus, um, you know, do not fear him who can kill the body, fear him who can kill the body and soul in hell. In other words, you should fear God 
You should fear no one or nothing else. Now, I think sometimes when we're in the context of sharing our faith with others, uh, we're tempted at times to be afraid, uh, afraid that the person maybe sitting next to us or that we run into at the grocery store or whatever, we're afraid that our worldview, that our words might offend them, and so often we just, we just don't say anything, you know? We keep to ourselves, pushing the cart down the aisle. We don't look up. We don't look around. We don't want to maintain any kind of contact within the world. And I would say we can't live like that. The Christians to which Peter's writing, they didn't live under the radar. They were right in the crosshairs of Rome. And they lived faithfully. Okay, now let's get into... Uh, Verse 15. Let's take each part. So number one, uh, what does it mean to set apart Christ the Lord as holy? All right. So in verse 14, we learned that the Christians that Peter is writing to are troubled. Um, They're experiencing persecution. Let's go back and read 14 again. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake... You will be blessed, and then he says this, have no fear of them, uh, nor be troubled. Do you have a footnote in your Bible? What Old Testament text is Peter alluding to? Perfect, Isaiah 8.12. So the question we could have to ask is, well, what was happening in Isaiah 8.12? Why is Peter alluding to that text? Well, in Isaiah 8, the prophet Isaiah is encouraging the king of Judah not to fear the enemies, the enemy armies of Israel, Aram, or Assyria. What else is interesting is that in the original context of Isaiah chapter 8, do you know who Isaiah is talking about? When he uses the name Lord in Isaiah 8, You know what he's talking about? Well, Isaiah chapter 8 is referencing Yahweh. Yahweh, that's a four-letter word for God in the Old Testament. How is Peter using the phrase Lord? Honor Christ the Lord. What is Peter saying about Christ? He is divine. He is of the nature of God. Now, I don't have on our outline, you know, a, a conversation with Mormonism or a conversation with Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, but if I were to have a conversation with them, it would start like this. I would look at the way that the New Testament uses the Old. Because in many places, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament text, the Old Testament is referring to Yahweh God. And our New Testament authors are going to apply that text to Christ. Now, I've read through the Watchtower magazine, the Jehovah's Witness magazine. They have nothing on this. They spend a lot of time on John 1.1, and they think that that's their silver bullet. But if you do what I'm telling you to do, you can engage in a very fruitful conversation with a Jehovah's Witness using text just like this, just looking at the way the Bible uses the Bible. All right, so Peter's making a statement of the deity of Christ here. He says, don't fear them, don't fear the enemy, but instead honor Christ the Lord as holy. What does the writer of Proverbs say about the beginning of knowledge? What is it? Fear the Lord, that's right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the writer of Proverbs says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So now we need to ask one more question. What does it mean to fear the Lord or honor the Lord? Yeah, reverence, absolutely. What do you think Peter means by it? Honor Christ, fear Christ. That's that, yep, absolutely. 
Uh, fearing the Lord means that He is the Holy One, that reverence is due Him. So we recognize His Lordship and the fact that He alone is God. We have to start there in our conversations with our non-believing friends, that Christ is God. And we can't just stop there. We, we have to say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the fundamental nature of God. When I have our dialogue with Judaism, that's going to be a big point that I'm going to raise later on. Uh, secondly, fearing the Lord means that, that His person and His word should be set above all human authority. What is the ultimate authority for the believer? Not a sure question. The Bible. The Bible. Did you know that there is no philosophy out there that you cannot engage with if you first know this? You know this well. Then all you have to do is ask questions of your non believing friend. Tell me about your worldview. Tell me about your religion. Tell me about your concept of God. Uh, tell me about your concept of revelation. Just listen to them talk as you ask questions, and then you can tell them the truth. That's called apologetics. But you have to know this first to do that. So God is our ultimate starting point. Uh, later, we're going to learn in a couple of weeks uh, the fact that God has given us two forms of revelation. Revelation in nature around us and revelation in His Word. Um, in order to honor Christ as holy, we have to know what He said in the Bible. In order to defend Christianity, we have to be students of this book. So what Peter's doing is he's looking at ultimately beginning starting points or ultimate starting points. Did you know that everybody has what I would call an ultimate presupposition, an ultimate beginning point? All of their answers, all of their understanding about the world around them, it's all going to go back to that basic starting point. The question is, what is their basic starting point? For the Christian, your basic starting point is the Word of God. If the Word of God speaks about a thing, and it speaks about many things, then that is the truth, and we do not stray from it. Even if modern science says, oh, well, that can't be the case, or, or archaeologists, archaeologists are always prone to blow their knowledge out, and they'll say, oh, yeah, we haven't found anything related to that yet, so that can't happen. I'd say, you know what? I'm going to go with this. Perhaps in a decade or two or a hundred years, they'll dig something up in the desert, and you'll be proven wrong based on your own science, but you won't believe it anyway, even if they do. So, anyway. The triune God is the starting point and the basic foundation for the Christian worldview and the fact that God has revealed himself in his word. If we abandon that, then we do not honor Christ as holy. Okay, when we're talking about basic starting points, I'll tell you a story uh, about this guy, Cornelius Van Til. He was riding on a train once, and on this train, he saw a young girl and her father, and they were playing, uh, you know, playing some sort of game to pass the time. And the young girl runs up, jumps into daddy's lap, and, you know, they're, they're playing a game, and slaps him on the cheek. And then she jumps down, she runs off, and she starts laughing. It was just a game, but Van Til, at that moment, the light bulb came on. He thought, oh, Eureka. This is what a non-believer must do in order to assault God. They must climb up onto God's lap, if you will, in order to strike him in the face. Why? Well, it's impossible to have a logical argument apart from the logical God that creates this world. Do you understand what I'm saying? The rules of philosophy, the rules of reasoning, the rules of logic, where do those rules come from? They don't come out of thin air. 
They come out of observing around us the way that the world that God made works. This is a logical world. This is not a chaotic world. Uh, this is not a world where pre-existent particles just came together and went splat and, you know, <laughs> now you have an automobile or gravity or something like that. No, this is a logical world that God has made, working according to logical principles. In order for the girl to strike her father, she had to presuppose the father before she could even strike him. So as non-believers try to use logic, what we're going to find out is, unless their logic is tied to this, their reasoning will be irrational. Even if it sounds scientific and intelligent, it will be irrational. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, <laughs> the transsexuality debate and the sexual revolution. You have MD doctors and PhD scientists saying, we don't know what a woman is. And I know what you were all thinking. Wait a minute. You have a terminal degree in a scientific field and you can't even tell me what a woman is? Could we ask your mother? Maybe she could tell us what a woman is. Because you had to come into this world somehow, and the only way that you came was through the womb of a woman, and you can't figure that out? Right. So, you know, often really smart people will say really dumb things. And the reason that they do is when they abandon the truth of Scripture, they then behave in irrational ways. And their logic to prove the irrationality of their ways will also be irrational logic. So why is it that we can't have a conversation with them? Well, first of all, we need the Holy Spirit to transform their nature. He does that great work. Ah, then we can begin to think rationally, reasonably. Until then... It would be very difficult. Okay, the second part of 315. Uh, be prepared to make a defense. The term that, that uh, Peter uses here for defense is a Greek word, apologia. Uh, it's the term that we get, uh, the Greek term that we get the English word apology from, or a defense. So Peter wants this church to always be ready for a defense. Why? Well, because believers are always getting drug off into the courts in the first century world and in our world as well. Uh, they're always ready to do what? To make a defense to anyone at, to any, excuse me, they're always prepared, always ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Uh, how do non-believers handle suffering? Yeah, not very well. They curse everything. They curse themselves, they curse God, they curse their neighbor, they curse their doctors. Um, how do you handle suffering? <laughs> yeah, amen. A whole lot of dependence upon God. Question is, is our response to suffering similar or different to that of a non-believer? How do you handle loss? I know we, we've, you can't live in the world for very long without experiencing loss. And, uh, you know, we look back even at this year of our church and we look at those that have lost their spouses. There have been several that experienced that. Question is, how do you, how do you handle that? How do you handle loss? And the follow-up would be, is it similar or different than the way that the world handles loss? So my point is that Peter is speaking of a situation in which the light of the believer is shining because they're so radically different. Uh, you know, you, you think of the stock market crash uh, in the 1920s. Or, uh, was it 30? What's the date of that? 1928, there we go. 
the stock market crash in 1928, how were the non-believers responding to that? Yeah, hurling themselves out of, uh, you know, tall buildings and killing themselves. What about the Christian? How are they handling that? Uh, I think the Christian would say, you know what? I'm not taking any of this stuff with me. I'm here for a short time. Let it go. Move on. And the world would look on and say, are you kidding me? No. No. Really? Mm. Yeah, so he, he didn't know his Bible. He wasn't ready. You know, part of, uh, part of Paul and Shannon's job is to get our kids ready. But you know what? It's, it's the parents' job to get the kids ready, uh, not Paul and Shannon's job. Uh, grandparents, family, get your kids, get your grandkids ready. Uh, encourage them to learn the Word of God. So they're making a defense. The term uh, apologia was used both in a legal courtroom setting. It was also used in more of an informal setting. The idea, though, is that non-believers were asking them, gosh, why are you different? Why do you handle this thing that I hate? Why do you handle it with grace when I handle it so awfully? So Peter's not telling the church, hey, go out there and start debates, you know. Look for anyone that wants to argue and argue with them. No, he, he has in view a situation where believers are so different than the world that when the world sees them, it asks, why are you different? Why aren't you like everybody else? Why won't you just conform? We've heard that a lot, right, since COVID and everything else. Why won't you just conform? Well, I'm not like that. Why not? Because... Christ has made us a new creation. It also means that we can't be isolated from the world. Uh, I, I'm not very pleased at all with where our country's going right now. I think it's absolutely dreadful. Uh, and I've often thought, man, it'd be great to go live in, you know, the middle of the woods in Alaska. Where the, you know. But they would find you there too, wouldn't they? I mean, there are reaches everywhere, but... We're prone to think of like ghetto mentality. You know, the world is against us, so what do we do? Well, we built a ghetto. You know, we have a gated community. <laughs> We're not a complete ghetto yet. No. <laughs> uh, Jesus says this, John 17, 15 through 18, high priestly prayer. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, his followers, but that you keep them from the evil one. So God didn't put you in this world for you to live in a ghetto. Um, God will protect you in this world. Jesus says this, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, set them apart in the truth. And what does Jesus say next? What is truth? Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. The issue is, how can we interact with non-believers if we're never around them? And I know what you're thinking. Well, man, you know, my, my life's pretty much down here. I say, well, do you, do you have a yard boy that comes and mows your yard? What about a bug sprayer guy that comes down and sprays for bugs or a maintenance guy or, you know. We have people that come into our world, even if we live outside of town and kind of off the beaten path. Peter also does not say that it's our job to persuade non-believers to accept the Christian hope that we have and so be saved. Defending our faith, apologetics, is not persuasion. At least I don't think it is. Persuasion is the job of the Holy Spirit. 
Persuasion is the job of God. I'll tell you, one of the things that made me really nervous about sharing my faith with others is that thought that it was all up to me to win the argument and persuade them to believe the truth. As I began to grow as a Christian, I realized, wait a minute, I don't save anybody. God does. Huh. And what is the gospel? Well, the gospel's his message. It's not my message. So the gospel is powerful because it is God's message. It's his message that he gives. We are the conduit for it by which he saves. The work is his, in other words. It's not ours. So I hope that takes some pressure off. Uh, Bonson, in his book, uh, writes this. We can offer sound reasons to the unbeliever, but we cannot make him or her subjectively believe those reasons. We can refute the poor argumentation of the unbeliever, but still not persuade them. We can close the mouth of the critic, but only God can open the heart. It is not our ability and not our responsibility to regenerate the dead heart and give sight to the blind eyes of unbelievers. Bonson concludes, that is God's gracious work. So part of defending your faith, no, part of the strategy in defending your faith is knowing what you can and cannot do. You can't save anybody. It wouldn't be the gospel if you could, would it? It would be the gospel of human works, which is not really gospel. God saves. We're empowered with a message that brings life. He does the work, not us. <laughs> I'd recommend a study Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, third part of it. Uh, be prepared to give a reason for your hope. When the New Testament uses the term hope, actually, let's start with Peter. When Peter uses the term hope, what is Peter referring to? He has in mind something. He doesn't just... We tend to use the word hope like this. Man, I hope it works out. The hope of glory? Yeah, let's combine those two answers. The hope of glory, which is resurrection hope. Uh, we can go back in our Bibles to 1 Peter 1 and verse 3 and read... Part of Peter's inter introduction, he says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. What does he say about the living hope? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, I, I've been to a lot of non-believers funerals and I've been to and done several believers' funerals, there's a drastic difference. And you know that. The non-believer, all they want to do is, let's just celebrate life. Let's pretend that they're not dead and that life goes on unhindered one big party. That's what they do, right? And, the, and funeral homes, they've taken that non-believing notion and they've marketed it. Celebrate life! Yeehaw! Let's laugh. Let's don't think about death when we get together and bury this person. Let's don't think about the fact that I'm going to be there one day. Oop. Let's just have a good time. Let's just party. I'm glad that was buttoned in back there a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ephesians 1, 18 through 20, he does. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Titus 2, 13. Uh, we can see it as well in Acts 24, 15. Peter's defense. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 21. Resurrection hope is all over the New Testament. Point is that when the believer faces death, we do it with resurrection hope. We do it with joy. We don't do it 
by avoiding it. We don't do it by looking at some kind of vain finality of existence, you know. They blew it all and life's done. No. We have a joy, we have a hope that goes beyond this world. That's right. That's right. It's not wishfulness. It's, yeah, it's, it's certainty. Yep, absolutely. So the apostles link the hope of the resurrection of Christ and his people. We rejoice with and reign with Christ spiritually and physically renewed in a, re, in a um, restored creation called the new heavens and the new earth. Peter will talk about this in his second book, 2 Peter 3. So we have a new creational hope in Christ. And you know what? The world needs that. Uh, when we face people that don't believe, uh, we should want to give them the same hope that we have. We should want to share that. All right. Um, let me say one more thing. Our hope is not in the government. I'm not a big fan of our government right now at all. Uh, I think it's godless. I think it's headed for destruction. Um, but my hope is not in the Republican Party either. Let me say that. <laughs> it's not in another candidate getting into the White House. Uh, that's not my hope. My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he lives, that he reigns, that we will be with him, that he will come again. That's our hope. Okay, uh, Peter's going to close us this verse with the manner in which we should defend our faith. And uh, let's see here, the very part, uh, very last part of verse 15 in the Greek text, this is actually verse 16. Um, so always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you now we get to the last part yet do it with gentleness and respect so by means of gentleness and respect that's how you make your defense uh, the term gentleness uh, is the Greek word proutes and it means the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Let me read it again. The quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. I know you guys have listened to debates. I know you guys have listened to talking heads on TV or on the Internet. And uh, it's very tempting to be enamored with smart people, isn't it? Wow. Smart and articulate. That person is smart, and they are well-spoken. You know, wow. Well, when we are defending our faith, if people look at us and they say, wow, so-and-so is smart and well-spoken, wow, wow, talk about, then we have failed. The goal of defending the faith is not to present oneself as brilliant. The goal of defending the faith is not to present oneself as well-spoken. What's the goal of the defending our faith? Presenting Christ. That's it. So our defense should never exhibit a spirit of pride or arrogance. And unfortunately, we've seen this in Christian debaters, haven't we? They get up on the stage, and the defending of the faith becomes for them, I'm defending myself against an opponent. And so the goal is win at all cost against the opponent. That's not our goal. Yeah, he does a good job with this. Yep, yep. 
It's hard to have a conversation with someone that has a totally different worldview than you do without feeling like they're attacking you and then feeling like you want to attack back, right? That's our flesh speaking. We can't live like that. We can't engage in conversations like that. So we are to do it with gentleness. We also to do this with uh, fear or respect. Um, One commentator says this, respect is marked by this. It's marked by that Christian meekness which is more likely to to commend the gospel to the suspicious mind. So not arrogance, respect. And let's apply it in a couple of ways. Uh, First, and I've said this already, but we'll we'll say it again. It's the gospel that saves men and women. So how do you share your faith? Well, you just tell them the good news. You might start by asking, how are you doing today? Would you like a cup of water? You know, to the worker out in your yard or something like that. And they say, yeah. Uh, are you having a good day? They'll say, either yes or no. And the conversation will begin. Do you know the good news? Yes or no. And the conversation will continue. So it is God who saves, not me and not you. Uh, that is freeing. How does he save? Well, the normal means by which God saves is by the gospel preached. Romans 10, verses 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach. Good news. So the point of defending the faith is not winning an argument. It's presenting the gospel. Uh, Second, and I've mentioned this, but we'll kind of bring it back one more time. Uh, It's also not about displaying how much we have read and how much we have studied. Uh, Again, that's very fleshly. Uh, To give a speech or to engage in a conversation and to have someone walk away saying, wow, you really know a lot about this. What does that do to us? (sighs) Yes, I do know a lot about that. I put a lot of work in. I've worked in that. That's not the point. The point is that Christ be glorified, Christ be magnified, not the human being, not the conduit. You've got to view yourself as you're sharing the gospel as conduit, not the object, right? Okay. Um, Let me encourage you guys. Let's take a couple of questions if you have any as we're wrapping this up, but I want to say this too. Uh, If there's something that I have not listed on the, you know, sheet of paper of topics uh, that you really want to talk about, if I haven't studied it, I'll do my best and study it and kind of give you my response of what I think on an issue. Um, but I don't want to do that off the, off the, off the cuff. So uh, just bring it up one of these weeks, and I'll say either, okay, I've looked into that, and I have an, and I have an opinion, you know, research the opinion, or I'll say, good question, haven't asked it yet. Looks like I need to do some research on it, and, you know, I'll, I'll try to tackle that. But I know this is not exhaustive. This is just kind of like a basic framework. Uh, At the very end, we're going to deal with uh, having conversations with those of other beliefs, other faith systems. Uh, And I've I've chosen, I think, three. What is it? Uh, No, no, four. Uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Islam. And I've done that because um, we are prone to face people that believe kind of Eastern religions. So I want you to know some about Eastern religions religions and how to kind of, where are the Achilles heels in those structures? And how can you approach those in a way to help someone uh, see the light of the truth instead of stumbling around still in the darkness? 
Um, so we have that. We also have uh, you know, other religions like Judaism and Islam where they will argue we're monotheistic just like you. And I would say to both of those, both Judaism and Islam, no, you are not. No, you are not. And I would, give it, and I would be prepared to give an answer. So I'll, I will um, try to prepare you to give an answer to the Jewish worldview uh, and to the Islamic worldview and try to poke some uh, holes in their way of thinking, not to you know, shame them, but just to, to try to be truthful about the situation. This is what they believe here are some problems. And this is where I would begin a conversation by asking these questions. So, all right, any, any final questions before we wrap it up? To the uh, resurrection, yeah, I, I haven't intended to talk about that in, in this section. We can, I mean, the truth of Christianity stands or falls with the resurrection. That's, you know, one component of it. And, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, believers and non-believers alike saw Jesus. Even non-believers like Tacitus will attest to Christ. Now, Tacitus doesn't attest to the resurrected Christ, but they do say he died by crucifixion uh, under the... Uh, procuratorship of Pontius Pilate. Like, you want some historical data that Jesus really lived? There you go, non-believer. He's saying it really happened. So, anyway. Yeah, we could, we could, we could do some on that. We'll, we'll try to fit it in. But. Uh, Susie and then Karen. Sorry. Right. No, no, and you know, um, I'm going to have the privilege of baptizing a Catholic, a former Catholic here, real soon. So, yeah, I mean, no, we. Uh, in order to be a member of the church, we have a statement of faith, and the reason why we do that is we want to be able to have a common starting point, and for our statement of faith, our statement of faith does not say this. The Pope and the church tradition is the final authority for the life and practice of the, of the believer. That's called Roman Catholicism. We would say, no, Scripture is the final authority for the life and faith of the believer. So the Roman Catholic is welcome in our church anytime. I would love to have them. However, if they make that move toward membership, then we would need to be able, to, hopefully we've discipled them in the process, and they've gotten to the point where they're like, yeah. I want to be a member of this church, and I believe what you believe. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we hope. But uh, there are some differences between Catholicism and Protestantism in general. And the, the, the really big difference is the one that we just touched on, the final authority. What is it? Is it tradition? Is it a pope? Or is it the Word of God? Based on the way that you answer that question, you're either going to be a Catholic or you're going to be a Protestant. So if, if you say that the Pope is the final authority and you're an American, I would say, do you really believe that? <laughs> do you know what your Pope's saying right now? Can you really go along with all that? You think he's, you know, infallible? Uh, you know what a lot of the Catholics that I've run into say, e even down here, they'll say, yeah, well, I can't stand the Pope we've got now. Yeah, right. Uh, but uh, a lot of Catholics, too, don't know the, the full structure of the system that they're in. They're kind of trapped in a system where they don't know all the rules of the game, and that's unfortunate. Um, I think it would be helpful to kind of point out some of the game to them. This is the way it works historically for you. Uh, Martin Luther's big problem was on authority. And as he looked at what the popes were saying, since they were infallible, he, he realized really quickly the popes were contradicting themselves. How can they be infallible and contradict each other? You know? Uh, if one says the sky is blue and the other says, no, it's brown, well, it's, it's either blue or brown, but it's not both. You know? So that, that began Luther thinking, and then he actually studied Romans, and 
he was like, oh, man, uh, we've got to get back to the basics. So in our church, we want to get back to the basics. And we've made our statement of faith, I think, uh, not exhaustive. Uh, we made it wide enough to include those that want to stand on this, um, but not so shallow that we believe any and everything. Karen, your question. God is moving. Praise God for that. Yeah, that, that's apologetics right there. It's presenting the gospel. So, uh, one more thing on uh, Susie's question. We do have some things in common with Roman Catholicism. We do share the Trinitarian understanding of God. God is one nature, three persons. We share the early creeds, the, the, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed. Uh, we, we have some common ground, uh, but we also have some differences, and we have to talk about those. So I, I know in uh, the evangelical world of the United States from like the 60s on, uh, it was very unpopular to, to talk about any differences. Uh, it was, let, let's just get along at all costs. And I think that there's a danger there. Um, and the danger is that there is truth, absolute truth. And we have to desire to get to that. We can't just avoid it and say, let's just get along. You, you, you kind of know what I'm saying? So... I am always open to have conversations with anyone of uh, either another, you know, Christian denominational position, uh, even another religion. I, I'd love to talk with you. Come on, let's, let's talk. Uh, I think we should be like that. We should always be inviting others to come in, and they're welcome, but they can't set the ground rules of what the church is here. That, that's the difference. That's why we have a statement of faith. Just invite them. Say, well, come. What's stopping you? Church starts at 9 a.m. So, all right. Let's pray and we'll finish up. And do your homework tonight. Okay. Lord, we thank you.